Hey everyone, welcome to our fourth episode of Worldwide Marketer, a podcast that seeks to spark authentic and meaningful conversations with marketers from all over the world. Today we'll be having Anze, where we'll be talking about his journey within the advertising space all the way from Slovenia. Welcome to the pod, Anze. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All good. So, well, let's kick start. So I wanted to ask, um, since you have some experience working in a Void Media Agency in New York and you're in Slovenia, so how did you get involved with Void Media at the start? Uh, well, actually, I was, uh, I was doing uh, media buying and creative strategy for our own personal brand, our family business. And then <clears throat> at that point, I was thinking I, I should also be helping other brands with my knowledge too. That was around six years ago. Um, and basically then I was just looking around, uh, and there was like Facebook groups were still popular back then. And yep. just, I saw, I saw someone mentioned that, uh, they're looking for media buyers and strategists and so on. So I just sent them a message and then like, I think it was like one week later, I was already working on them. Wow, that was that was fast. So I'm I'm wondering yeah. how is it like working in the void media as well as the creatives on the creative side? How's the day to day work like? So um, in the beginning it was a little bit different because at that time there was there was still not a lot of focus on on the actual creatives. Uh, we kind of transitioned that uh, and we went uh, full in into the creative strategy and we build a content production team and so on. Cause at that point we, we had like clients that had a couple of images and that's it. So you didn't have a lot of to work with. Uh, there was like no sign of UGC or anything back then. So we had to be creative how we can just make some animation around the product and so on. So it was a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, then, then after a couple of years, we built that content production team. And then all of a sudden we had a, a lot of more ca capabilities to, to, to make good content. All right. I see. And pre in the past, since there's not a lot of UGCs since TikTok haven't come through yet. I'm wondering how is it like creating the branded content as well from the end? What's the difference really between a branded content and a UGC content as we see right now? So it's, uh, it can be just through editing, like if you put, um, captions that are on brand, if you put a logo in, that's all of a sudden more branded, then you have some visuals that are higher quality, um, uh, maybe some slow motion shots, all of a sudden that becomes more branded. Um, but it's true that you need to have a good balance between native and branded stuff. And especially, I know that most brands or yeah, most brands would prefer branded content, uh, because it looks better. Uh, but the reality is we need to listen to the audience and audience respond, at least for now, they respond better for more native visuals, uh, just because they, they believe it more, they feel it's more authentic, but also, um, maybe in the first few seconds, it doesn't feel like an ad. Um, so they actually give you a chance that, okay, I will dedicate five seconds for you. Uh, cause if you start a video immediately with some high quality animations or whatever, immediately you, they know it's an ad. I won't give you one second. So that's like very, very important to know that we just need to listen to our audience. Right, I see. I'm wondering for your uh, pro journey when you're working for Boy Media, when you are doing the branded content, also UGC content, I'm wondering, is there any differences you notice when it comes to, let's say, demographics? Like, let's say, do you feel like older people prefer branded content and the younger generation prefers the UGC content? Is, do you see that divide as well from your end? Um, more, more, I see that it's, it's more about the pacing. So for all older demographics, they need, those videos need to be a little bit slower. Um, those videos that are more direct response, uh, more like an infomercial style, older people really buy into that. Uh, right. while younger people, 
are more yeah into TikToks, more into like unique storytelling through through a certain situation, and then they kind of uh, transition to the product. So it's not so salesy at least in the beginning of the video. Right. So for the older generation, because they grew up being familiar with the infomercials, watching TV, so they are used to just saying, "You have this problem. Here is how you can solve it." and try and great offer. While for the younger ones, it's more, you have to hook them in with a good story since they're tired of ads. And then to make it feel like it's not an ad at first, then only then you can start to say your problem and the solution and a great offer. Do you see the difference between them? It's just that you need to have a great story, a unique story, in fact, just to hook them in compared to the older population. Yeah, definitely. Um, storytelling is there. It's, it's a huge factor. I mean, also with older demographic, but with older demographic, you can, you can still try those proven direct response formulas, uh, where with younger demographic, you, you kind of, you kind of need to sneak that direct response inside that story. Right. Perhaps do you have any like, um, examples you could thought of as well that is quite successful in the past you implemented, uh, that you could share with the, the podcast audiences yeah, as well? Yeah, we, we had one video. Um, uh, that's very, um, let's say outside the box, it it's for a backpack. And yep. basically what we did is we shoot content on the street where we actually stole the backpack. Uh, and then we put a person in the studio and he had like a mask on and he's talking to the camera reasons why I stole this backpack. So then he start talking about it and he starts selling that backpack to the audience. But the start of the video is like someone running to grab a backpack from other person's hands and he runs away. So it's kind of a, uh, it doesn't look like an ad. So that hook ratio, it's also amazing. And yeah, the performance of the video is still great because the second part of the video we are actually selling. So it, it's a very good concept. Right. And you've, mentioned an interesting metric called a hook rate and to all the audiences they are not very familiar in the world of creatives i'm wondering when during your day-to-day -day work what sort of metrics do you use to measure a creative performance what makes it work well yeah so uh i look mostly at the hook ratio and the hold metrics so uh, i call it hook and hold uh the point is that the hook ratio is the first three seconds of the video so how many people out of those, like how many people actually stop the scroll and did we get the attention? So the first three seconds, but now in the last four or five months, months, I went a little bit deeper into that. And it's basically, uh, it's not just, uh, the hook ratio. It's also the hold rate, uh, which means, uh, the first 15 seconds. So. That means that out of those who stop the scroll, how many of those guys are actually watching the video at least 15 seconds? So then all of a sudden you measure the drop off after the first three seconds. So that's very important because, um, imagine that you are scrolling on the Facebook and you are not, you're not interested in that backpack. You just want to see your friends, what they're doing. That's it. Then all of a sudden, uh, you see a video that someone is stealing a backpack. And of course, yep. uh, a lot of people are going to stop the scroll and watch. Uh, and then all of a sudden you are 15 seconds in the video and you are actually looking at that backpack, looking at its features, looking at benefits. Um, and then all of a sudden you start thinking, should I have this? So that's, that's actually the point to, to try to get those 15 seconds from a person that doesn't even know who this brand is, doesn't even think that they need a new backpack. So that's like the, the beauty of everything. Right. That's interesting. So I highlighted the hook and the hold. Normally I yeah. personally only heard of the hook rate and hold rate is something interesting. So you would say that the creatives you are creating is mostly more than 15 seconds. So how, what's the good length that you normally aim for when it comes to creating, let's say a UGC ad or a content ad or a branded content ad, are they different in terms of the length or would they be similar? How would it work? 
for your case? They, they are they are pretty similar in terms of length, but the length is like it's very different from the product. Like the right. the video should be as long as it needs to be, but not a one not one second longer. Because uh, the point is, you could have an ad or a, a, a product that requires a lot of education. That video is usually be it's gonna be always over forty seconds. Like, if you need to educate them about, I don't know, a certain blood sugar device that monitors how your body responds to different type of food, you need to educate that. Otherwise, people will be, they don't care, right? Um, but then you have a video about a certain, I don't know, kit for nails. Uh, you don't need a lot of education. Yeah, you need to a little bit, but you can point out everything in 25 seconds. So my videos, like oh, almost none of the videos are below 15 seconds. Like I'm, I'm like the shorter videos for me are around 20 seconds, unless, unless I always have like, let's say for Q4 right now, we are playing around with short form videos when we just make some boomerangs and some text animations above it and that's it so the videos can be like seven seconds long so those videos perform really well in q4 just because people are very uh focused on buying products in q4 so you don't want to overwhelm them with information so i we give them like short form videos too um but other than that yeah i really like um around 20 seconds plus and let's say around 30 seconds is the sweet spot right that's interesting to hear that there's even seasonality when it comes to the video content as well because of factors such as q4 black friday cyber monday christmas everything popping mm -hmm. right left front center so that's why you are looking to shorten it because you know they are in the buy mode and would you say that for q1 to q3 because it's all building up for the Q4, so you would normally use that time to educate and build the audience rather than trying to yeah. sell them right at the spot? Yeah, exactly. Right, okay, that's good, that's good. Personally, I'm very new in the creative process, and I'm just wanting to ask as well, I think some of the audience may ask, what is the difference between a creative producer and a creative strategist? Because sometimes people might be confused between the difference between them and sometimes they thought hiring a producer means they are to strategize. What, why, why is it that they need two different roles? Yeah, so creative strategy requires a couple of layers. So Perfect. first of all, you need to know, I think the, the most important thing is to be a copywriter or to some degree, you need to know copywriting. Uh, and copywriting is not just write a script it's also the first part which is usually overlooked it's the research part so you need to know your audience you need to know your product you need to know your offer you need to know like all those informations are very important but then you go into the ad account and you look at the data and you look at those creative metrics that i mentioned who can hold rate and of course you look at the performance metric and then all of a sudden you get like a full view, what's working, what's not working, um, what we didn't try yet. So basically you need to gather all this information and then you put together a creative strategy. So that's like a more high level stuff. And once you have that strategy, then you go into angles, scripts. So that's where um, you need to actually write scripts and then once that is done, you go into testing and then you need to learn how to look at the data. So you do the creative analysis. So it needs to be like everything together. Uh, the point is that like some media buyers are very, uh, let's say, uh, very uh, number driven. Like they, yep. they know everything about numbers, but the problem for them is the actual content creation. Um, so I mean, I was lucky that I always had to do both. The, like I, I had to do media buying and I had to do like all those bidding 
uh, bidding strategies that usually worked. So um, I know how to look at the data, but then I also have to do the creative part. So everything is pretty, let's say, easy for me. But if you have a team and you have a good media buyer, but he just can't figure it out regarding the, the creative part, then you need someone that's more on the creative side. And in my opinion, I would pick uh, I would pick some copywriter and then just train them to, to, to know how to look at the data because it's not that hard. Right. So because you, you would say that creative strategies, uh, essential foundation is they know copywriting because with copywriting, they're able to understand the, let's say a framework that have in mind to create, which will help them to create a script and follow through, let's say with something, a hook, a problem, a solution and an offer, something like that. Is that correct? So exactly. or, I see, I see. It's very interesting as well, because I've recently heard creative strategies coming up more often because previously in media buying, a lot of people are talking about structures or like the copy. Would you say that in this today's world, creative is becoming more and more important compared to just copyright copy itself? How would you prioritize, let's say an ad, would you prefer a creative first copy headline? How would you order it in terms of the importance? Creative, like in my opinion, way above um, copy and headline. It's like, uh, we had a couple of situations where we had like uh, an ad that's working really well and we iterated just to copy in a headline and the performance was pretty similar. Uh, then we, we, a couple of times happened that we, we made a mistake and we have a video, but the, the headline and the copy was wrong. Actually, it was like for a different product, the, the media buyer uploaded the wrong copy. And we figured it out after, I mean, we figured it out a little bit later because we saw the results and we left it running and results were great. And then after we spent it like over 100 K, uh, it was like, we noticed that there's a mistake in ad copy, uh, but the results were great. So we just left it. So that also gave us like very good indication that people don't read, they just look at the videos and photos, like they are lazy, you know, they are on social platforms and they, they are just, you know, so wow. that means, I mean, there's of course a certain type of offers that you need to test copy and headline. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but yeah. my focus is mainly through, through the actual creative. And then inside that creative, there's a lot of things you can iterate and improve. Um, but, um, over, over, like if you compare media buying and the creatives, uh, I know when I was a media, when I was also doing a media buying, if I didn't have good creatives, it was very hard. You, you had to tweak so many stuff. You need to, you were always on the edge of something like, is it profitable? Is it not? But once you have the creatives, media buying becomes much easier. Of course, right now it's a lot of work because of iOS 14 and you need to use different platforms to get that performance data. And it's a lot of work to navigate through all of that. But, uh, before that, and right now, after that, if you don't have good creatives, of course you need to have the product and landing page and everything. But if we are talking about creatives and media buying, it's kind of a, like your creative is media buyers ammunition. If you don't have that ammunition, you can't do it. I think I'm, I'm still mind blown by the fact that running the wrong product copy and the creative still kills it. And it's a very interesting story as well. It kind of got me thinking as well, because personally, I, I used to thought that copy is the most important followed by headline and creative. But the more I chat with marketers from all around the world, the more I see a similar trend or pattern where everybody seems to point to the direction of creative first, maybe headline and then copy at the end. Would you, would that be your yeah. case as well? Yeah, I would say that that's the correct sequence. I mean, you just need to think like, imagine, and also now that's on TikTok, everything is just yep. video. Do you read yep. those captions down below? Probably not, no. very rarely, no. right? You <laughs> just really want, 
maybe you can read that top banner that it's on top of the video that you put yeah. in the video. Yeah, of course you read that. Uh, but yeah, like we are just so bombarded with information and everything that we are overwhelmed and it's very hard to focus on something and actually read. Like I also, I was, uh, like, I think that our brain process of visuals, I don't know, 65,000 quicker than actual reading. So it's so much easier for our brain. And then also I was listening to one marketer, how he reads books and he said, I'm reading books, but at the same time, I'm also listening audio book. So I'm consuming information through reading and audio so that I get the most out of that book. So you see, he's also trying to help his brain to be focused more or to get as, as much information as possible. And that is why creative is so important because we just give attention to that. Uh, and that is why videos that are uh, with great storytelling are actually the best videos because great story will always attract our attention. Agree. Since ever since on humans always love stories and it's always the easiest as well. That's why we love biographies, man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So um, I wanted to ask as well, um, since you mentioned that, um, like for example, TikTok people are used to um, seeing videos all the time, consuming content. So would you say that because of that, when they are looking at other platforms, they also expect other platforms to simulate that. So hence forcing other platforms, media buyers to use the TikTok style creatives into that. Would you say yeah, so? that's Yeah, that's probably why uh, TikTok style creatives work on Facebook too, but not the opposite. If you put a Facebook ad in TikTok, it, it's very rarely that it's going to work. So it's definitely, uh, one of the reasons. Um, and yeah, it's just a new trend of, of information. Like there's so much content on TikTok, and, uh, yeah, storytelling is so important even more than like six months ago. So yeah, that's definitely a trend. And now you see with the reels and YouTube shorts and so on, everything goes into that direction. Right. I'm wondering when you mentioned that you bring Facebook ads to IG, uh, to TikTok, it might not work. So what are the creative sort of format differences in the social media platform do you see works best? Let's say for Facebook, what uh, content or creative content would you say it's working so far for Facebook? What works for Instagram and what work for, what works for TikTok for this case? So for, for Facebook and Instagram, it's pretty similar. Um, uh, all three platforms are very UGC focused, uh, yep. it still works, but let's say on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram, it can be a little bit more scripted. It can be a little bit more polished visuals. Um, right. but on, uh, on TikTok, it's more like, uh, I call it situational UGC, which means, Ooh, um, you use, let's say you pick an angle that you want to talk about. And then you put that creator in one specific situation. Um, and then she will start talking to the camera in the middle of that situation. So, and then she builds a story around it. So it is just a little bit different style, but, um, because it's true situation, it doesn't look like an ad in the beginning which is very important for, for all platforms, especially. Right. Would you say that there's still any chances for still images of carousel for Facebook and Instagram now seeing that videos are starting to becoming a more and more important role in the media buying role? Yeah. I mean, you still need to use it. Um, like sometimes on image ads or carousels, CPMs are just so, so much lower that it just the, the mathematics just work. Um, but, um, definitely like when you have a good video, it will outperform images almost all the time, but you always need to have all versions of creative types. Like you need to have 
UGC, you need to have product focused um, videos, you need to have some elevated stuff, you need to have image ads, carousels. So there's need, there needs to be a combination of everything because not just uh, people respond differently to different angles and motivators why why they would buy a product, but they usually also um, respond differently to a certain uh, type of creative. So some people just don't like UGC. Most people do, but some of them they don't. And so that's why you need to try something, I don't know, stop motion video. So, um, so there's there's always a variety of that right when let's say in the let's say in the back in the days you know we have the top of funnel middle funnel bottom funnel because of ios everything doesn't seem to be allow you to structure it in the accounts way but would you still apply that concept into creators production if so how would you see the content formats come into play would you say video would be top of funnel introducing your product and then carousel let's say in the middle on and then final is an image based on what products they view how do would you think that this method is applied by your end as well? Would you apply this method? Yeah, so I'm 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 doing a little bit differently. Um, I always focus mainly on top of the funnel because it's the hardest thing to do, um, and because um, because I always try to test various angles because like every product can be sold in like at least five various things. Um, so, and imagine that you have 10 angles, five of them won't work, but those five can be tested in remarketing. Uh, and you also need to test all of those creatives in remarketing. Um, so I'm not splitting that around too much because, you know, sometimes um, you need to put a certain objection that people have like, <clears throat> I don't know, people have objection about, let me see, yeah, I don't remember right now the exact the, the example, but anyway, there's always like two or three objections that people don't buy. Um, Prices or like... Yeah, it's, it's pricing, pricing is, of course, it's objection, but if the content is great, that you really put out the value, then price is not that important anymore. Because if you put out the really good, um, let's say, really good um, uh, angle and pain point, then all of a sudden price doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, but yeah, you have a couple of objections. Does it work? Can you prove it? Um, does it work with my oily hair? Uh, I have sensitive skin. Does it work with me? So then, okay, sensitive skin now all of a, all of a sudden becomes an angle uh, because that's the objection. And then um, you can start a video with the creator talking to the camera. I have very oily skin or I have very sensitive skin and I tried this and that. It didn't work because of this. But since I'm using this product, it's my skin is, even though it's uh, sensitive, it just works. So it's the angle is completely focused on the sensitive skin, but you can target on top of the funnel <coughs> and uh, people with sensitive skin will usually stop the scroll. But sometimes people that saw a different type of ad but then in remarketing, they will see sensitive skin uh, type of ad. Then all of a sudden you, you, you hit them in remarketing. So that's why you need to test um, them on all parts of the funnel. Right. So you would, so, so for your case, you you start off with various, various angles at top of funnel, but you wouldn't just, let's say you found what works and you keep it on from the start to the end. You will also test different angles as you trickle down the funnel because you wanted to make sure that people with different pain points can relate to it because you believe a product can solve different problems, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Mm. When it comes to designing and let's say, because I know that time is limited for all of us media buyers, we'd love to sit down and come up with as many angles as possible. 
what is the sweet spot you realize in terms of the normal amount of angles you really that you need to come up for a brand to test and then iterate and scale? So I usually I usually try um so let's say when I start with a client and I start from scratch, uh, of course, I look at the data and if I see that some of the angles are proven, I will definitely try that to, uh, to nail those angles more. But I always try two or three angles, uh, completely new, fresh angles, and I want to try that. Or maybe I could look in the ads manager that uh, some of the angles that they tried they really didn't work, but then I look at the metrics and I see that the hook ratio for those angles were really bad. So honestly, that angle was not really tested properly because almost nobody saw that. So yes. maybe you just need to change the hooks uh, for that angle. So, but I always try to, to start with three to four angles. Um, and then once, once you gather data, then you go more into iteration. Right. For the three to four hooks, you mentioned that at uh, three to four angles, you also mentioned that you would try to test different hooks of the same angle. Then how many hooks would you be willing to give a chance for the angle uh, before you call it quits for your case? Yeah, usually usually I go with three hooks. Right. Oh, sounds like a good number. Three and three. Three, ang three to four angles and then three hooks per angle. Yeah. So that means I can test 12 times, 12 times perhaps? The entire... Yeah, something like that. I mean, um, it can be one uh, one angle, and then uh, that angle has three hooks, and you put them in one ad set, uh, and then um, all three videos let them fight between each other uh, for that. Ooh, I'm wondering for your case as well. Uh, then, how long would you let it run until you say, "Okay, this is enough for me to determine whether it is a winner or a loser"? Change the hook or change the angle. How long would you give it the time for it to go for hooks and angles? Yeah, it, it, it's 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 no silver bullet here because um, yeah. price range of the product can be like your CPA target can be twenty bucks or it can be two hundred bucks. So it really depends. Um, but because we are looking a lot more now at the soft metrics such as hook ratio and hold ratio, then all of a sudden you can determine pretty quickly if people are relating to the actual video or not. So um, you can you can see I don't know thousand or two thousand impressions. Um, you can see. Uh, what is happening in those first three seconds, first 15 seconds. Uh, and then and then you see the performance metrics and if it's close, maybe you leave it a little bit longer and so on. Oh, that's interesting. You mentioned you use impressions uh, to evaluate uh, just let's say the first 1000 and you kind of see the result in, instead of using things. Would you, what are the sort of signals would you use? Would amount spend we want would be one angle you will look at as well to see has it reached enough and then you guys would only evaluate is it in have you have spent enough to for me to determine whether is it a good or no go yeah you you need to you need enough data that's definitely one of the biggest mistakes is to to pause too early um you you need to leave it a little bit longer um just to get significant data um but because of the hook ratio and whole hold rate, uh, it's it's much easier uh, to get the data pretty quickly because impressions, it's it's easy to get thousand or two thousand impressions pretty quickly, um, and that that number is usually pretty close to what will happen with I don't know million impressions. So it's pretty close. Uh -huh. um, nice. So, but still, you need to usually I. It really depends, but I, re I really, I really like to leave ads on for at least a week. Um, right. Give it time, right? Be, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, and I'm wondering as well, like since in the world of media buying, there's mostly it's just two parties, the e-com and the lead gen. And I've heard debates that say create or creative wise, like video works very well for e-com and lead gen might not be the case. Do you see any similarities and differences between in terms of the creative requirements for both e-com and lead gen in general? 
I mean, I'm I'm mainly focused on econ uh, or or apps, um, but <clears throat> I mean, overall, you're still selling something, even if it's a lead gen. Uh, but with lead gen, you can you can talk about let's let's say free download or whatever. So you can build a story around that. Um, so it's it's pretty simple stuff, but it's still not. It's not like, like so direct compared to the actual econ. Right. So, so lead gen would be more of a not requiring more storytelling. Would you say compared to econ? Because econ, you can yeah. show the product itself, but lead gen is more like services business. So it's really hard for you to um, show the features directly. So you use indirect ways to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's interesting as well because I personally work more on a lead gen side, so I'm not too sure how or if th there is any difference really at all between like any creative format differences. Like some would prefer video for ecom or some prefer images for lead gen. So that is something. Yeah. So I mean, for lead gen, you still need to think what you are offering for free. So to gather uh, an email, you are offering something for free. So let's say you you give them a PDF doc with ten bullet points that will help them. I don't know with what with exercise or whatever. So yeah. you can talk about what's in that PDF. So you can build a story about. Let's say you have ten exercises to, I don't know, um, lower your back pain or whatever. You can talk about one specific exercise and why this exercise is so unique. But for the rest nine exercises, just click on the link. That's it. So you kind of give them a sneak peek of something. Right. That is interesting as well. And I wanted to ask is uh, being a creative strategist, you mentioned research is very important. So how would you do your research when you are working with a client for this case? Um, I usually send them a questionnaire um where they answer around i think it's around 15 questions and then uh of course i look at their website i look at their ads manager uh and then most of the times i also go on reddit and read some more emotional stories about certain pain points or whatever and then based on that i i pull i throw everything in the in the in the doc i call it brain dump and oh, then, then when I have all that information in there, then I kind of filter which are the most important selling points. And then I segment those selling points into primary and secondary. And from then I, I decide which creative style, which angle, uh, and so on. I would pick. Right. Normally, how long would you give yourself? When it comes to researching in general, I understand that different clients, some might be easy, some might be hard, but normally how long would you give yourself when it comes to a research phase as well? Um, yeah, it really depends how much material you have. Um, and sometimes if you work with a product that it's very unique, you don't need to be, you don't need to do so much research because the, the product actually does the heavy lifting. Um, and also if the product is unique, your marketing doesn't need to be so creative. It just needs to be clear. You need, you, you just need clarity and just showcase the product in a clear way. But if you are in a red ocean, which is a very competitive market and you are selling, I don't know, a certain shampoo or a certain vitamin or whatever, there's where is there a lot of competition, then you need to find unique selling proposition. You need to find that mechanism. You need to know how to deposition the competitors. So uh, it's a lot of more uh, a research part. So it could take a couple of days to get together all of those data and then to segment and filter all the way. So yeah. So you mentioned a Reddit as one platform and the own brands like website and then the question ad they have filled out. Uh, is there any other forums that you would recommend the readers to check out as well if they were to do their research? 
Um, the only thing is left is, of course, reviews. Uh, right. It can be reviews on the website. It can be reviews on the actual uh, competition website. Uh, of course, Amazon reviews. Uh, there's a lot of info. And, of course, comments below the ads. Um, so that's always very important. Like one, one trick could be that you go on your competitor's website, you look, um, you scroll a little bit, you, you get hit by remarketing ads, and then you read comments below those ads and you see what people are talking about your competitor. And then all of a sudden you maybe can get some ideas, um, for videos too. Oh, that, that is an interesting one. So it's voluntarily getting targeted by competitors. So when they hit you up, you can just use whatever the, the satisfaction they have, turn it into a solution they can solve the pain points by your competitor, raised by your competitors users. Wow. Yeah. That is a very interesting process. I never thought about that. I only know the Reddit forum and the website stuff. That's, that, that's great. That is awesome. I'm wondering as well for your case, whenever you, ins after you get like the research phase and then it will go, it will boil down to the inspiration phase, right? Collecting the creatives to see what you need to, or what the creatives you need to do with the angles. Do you have any sort of certain angles you would definitely test for each client or do you just scroll through the ad library of the industry, then you decide how is it, how does it work for your end? Um, angles can be done or can be made from two sources. First yeah. source is your persona. Uh, second source is your product. So that's something that you need to first look at. Then of course you look at the competition and other, other, um, other sources. And then you also look at, uh, life force eight, uh, and that's um, <clears throat> more psychological angles. And then you can also look at secondary ones. You have nine secondary ones and you basically, you can, uh, you can talk about, um, you, you can find angles there. Is it curiosity? Is it efficiency? Uh, I mean, all those uh, talking points can be, can be your angle. Um, and then basically, yeah, then you decide which you, which in your opinion should be like the first three to test. Um, of course you never know which is the correct angle, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of data, if you have a client that doesn't have a lot of, uh, yeah. they didn't spend a lot. It's a little bit harder, but you can still get help from the actual, uh, competitors, for example. So. Uh, that's definitely uh, how I would look at it. Right. So you've mentioned something interesting where you said you use the primary and secondary, uh, do you say emotions for that case? Like primary and secondary uh, selling points. To... Oh, right. Primary selling point, secondary selling point, and then you list out the uh, angles from there on, and then you checked out the competitors as well to see if there's anything that has been mentioned based on your listed angles. And at the end, it's up to you to see which one you want to take on. Exactly. Right. Is there any sort of um, video angles you see that are very popular uh, right now, like across the, let's say, TikTok or Facebook, Instagram, currently any angles you see it's taking it? it um, very I, high definitely, I definitely really like, and I see a lot of success with curiosity angles. Oh. Um, so that means that, um, you could start with, I used to have a lot of back pain, then I tried this. So you point out the problem, but then you transition, then I tried this and it kind of sparked curiosity. Um, then you could like, she ate a banana, then this happened. So all of a sudden people are very curious what happened. And the, the, the video is for a blood sugar uh, measurement device, which means, um, then I explained that blood sugar went from 80 to 90. 
because I ate a banana. So that's kind of a, um, an example here. So definitely curiosity hook uh, or angle is very important uh, and I really like to try it. Then you need to have a couple of ang angles that are more beneficial. Then you need to have a couple of angles that are more problem focused. So you have like very various angles. Then you can go more directly into persona specific angles that maybe you talk about busy moms and you showcase how they are busy and how this, I don't know, smoothie helps them save time, but they still can eat healthy. Right. That, that, is, that is interesting. So to see you mentioned the curiosity hook is the primary a popular angle and followed by that could be the directly saying the problem and then you give a solution and then linking towards a, a selling point as well. So yeah. that is the two trends that you have noticed so far. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Do you see any upcoming trends as well besides those or anything that you've seen that has, that used to work, that works really well in the past, but doesn't really work now? Three reasons why it used to work really well. Uh, oh, I, feel work like it's, I feel like it's a little bit saturated. Um, right. But you can transition like instead of three reasons, you could say three locations that I use this product. Um, or um, three benefits you get this from this product. You know, it's just different than three reasons. Um, so, so it's still three, but just different way of phrasing. Yeah, people like people like those listicles or three reasons why, five reasons why. So people like that just because it's like it's very structured and it's easy to consume. Um, but um, yeah, those TikTok made me buy it, and those <clears throat> those angles or kind of trends are usually very hype for a couple of months, then they just die. Oh, so, man. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I, personally, I thought three reasons why it's still a new new one. Um, maybe I'm not really keeping up with the trend. Thanks a lot for sharing that as well. I'm wondering when it comes to, let's say, researching the other creatives you are doing. And I came across a term where people say they are building their swipe file. And um, could you share with us what does building a swipe file means? And how do you build your own swipe file? So you mean for creative inspiration? Yes. Yeah. Just to source any creative. Yeah. Stuff. Usually, usually we have that internal and basically when we see an ad, uh, that we like, we, we put together like bullet points, what we like about that ad. And then we throw that in our swap uh, file. Um, so, um, and that's basically it. It's like, it's just building the actual uh, list. Right. Would you do it in, or do you have any specific platform where you guys do it on a swipe file? Is it through Notion board or is it Google Drive? Like where would you normally do your swipe files at? To keep it organized, you know? So yeah. I mean, we need to transition everything to Notion. I mean, that's, that's the plan right now. We have it in, in Google Drive. <clears throat> right. So yeah, I think Notion is the best. Mm. Do you use any creative tools as well to source it? Personally, I discovered a platform called Foreplay where I just click and save the ads, whatever I see fit. Do you use that or do you have any other new tools that you are, that you are using um, right now? I used it before. Right now, I don't. Um, oh, what's the reason? Um, I mean, it just... Um, I mean, I was just trying it out. I didn't use it for long. Um, right now I'm still very like, I just go into ads library and just check creatives of that brand, like what they're doing. Uh, and then I, I don't know, make some screenshots, make some downloads or whatever. And then we go from there. So it's not like, cause we have like, we built a list of creative styles. And then we just follow those creative styles for now. All right. So you guys have already done the homework previously and you already listed the creative styles you want to do. So uh, you guys are not 
like doing for every single brand, but more like you have a set list of styles and you guys just see if there's anything that might get your attention and you might add it onto the list as an add-on for the specific brand. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's interesting because I thought you guys would have to restart all the time. And I'm like, how do you guys have the time to do the research yeah. and I like, list it all? Must be very time consuming. Yeah, we, we have like a five creative styles that uh, we have a, like a library of, I think around 33 creative styles, but <clears throat> right now we are very focused on like around five of them. <clears throat> what would be your top three creative styles that <clears throat> you, your, your team specifically likes to use for this case compared to, uh, other styles you guys have listed in? Um, definitely very UGC focused, uh, some UGC mashups, uh, are oh great. Nice. Um, situational UGC, um, and then, um, we really like lately elevated UGC. So that means that UGC, it's a combination of UGC and more elevated visuals. Oh, that is so situation UGC and, and, the for that one, it's more like a describe a scenario more for Gen Z's. Is that correct? Like where you use a scenario to hook them in. <clears throat> Right, pain point solution and then a call to action for the other two they are one is a normal ugc is that correct like what what does the ugc mashup mean for this case mashup means that you combine let's say three or four creators and you build a story around it is it like stitch function on tiktok or no it's it's like creator number one says one sentence creator number two will say the second sentence so you need to uh, mix and match them so it makes sense. But if you put in like various creators, uh, the whole video is very dynamic. Oh, oh, I see. I see. I thought that you guys would have, um, is it similar where you have the, let's say three UGC mashups, like the, the mashup have three UGC creators. So you have two of them say the exact same things, record it, should share with you guys the raw footage and you guys mix and match the content to see which one, which would you see six says the creator says it better for based on the sentences. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't give them direction to say the same things. Like oh. we have like, let's say four creators, one, um, every, every creator talks about different angle and then we test that first. But once we have that asset, then we put together mashups from those creators, which is also like very efficient. You mentioned that you don't really give them a lot of, um, like, re re like in terms of restrict, we can call restrictions. Like, how would you uh, find the creators and then collaborate with them? Do you use any platforms or do you reach out to them personally for the collaboration? Yeah, we, we have a team, um, that basically just reach out to them. Uh, whenever we see a good creator, we just DM them. Um, and then we talk about conditions and so on, but we usually, <clears throat> we don't need their audience. So we don't care if they are very small. We just like their, their, um, energy in front of the camera. Um, right. and we also, we also have more and more creators that are actually actors and they know how to perform in front of the camera and they are even better. So, and then we give them scripts and they provide us with raw files. Right. So you wouldn't let them edit the stuff because you wanted them to just focus on being on themselves rather than ask them to do every sort of thing yeah. in terms of editing and all that. Right. Is there a reason for that or? I mean, I want them, um, I want them to be natural in front of the camera, but still follow, uh, our direction. <clears throat> but if we get raw files from them, then we can do mashups, do a lot of stuff that, um, that otherwise we couldn't. So that's why we need raw assets. Oh, that's, that is, that is good. Quite good to hear as well. Hearing that you guys are supporting the creators economy in terms of just reaching out to them and collaborating with them. Is it more on like a part-time basis or do you guys take them in as, okay, just join us as full-time and then just crank out content for us on a rolling basis? Um, we have like, we built a, a pool of content creators. Right now we are around at number 80. Um, wow. 
Yeah, and by, by the end of this year, we should be close to 100 creators. And the idea is that all of them are like, they are um, younger or they are 70 year old. So uh, they are really, it's, it's a very broad aspect of those creators. And what I really, um, uh, I have them in house, uh, not, not in house, I have them <clears throat> like, I pay them by project because you never know which target demographics we need. So I yeah. can't, I can't use them every week, but sometimes I use them three times per week. So it really depends what kind of clients I work with at that time. Right. That makes sense because for Gen Z products, you normally prefer to pick Gen Z's rather than picking people of an older demographic or else it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Have you tried out those um, online booking talent agency platforms as well? Like what makes you decide, what make you decided to go reach out to yourself personally instead of having, going through the platform? I don't know. I tried it. I didn't have so, so many good experiences. You never know what you get back. Um, so I don't know. That's just, I mean, now that we have 100 people or almost 100 people in the house, we don't need to search around that much. Is it before previously that, um, like the influencers might, because it's through the platform, there's not a lot of relationship building. It's more like just numbers and it's not really yeah. that good working with them. They would try to cheat Would that. Is that your case? Is that why you have back? Yeah, I, mean, I, just didn't get, I just didn't get back good, good content. So I had to do something. Uh, so. Right. That, that's true. How long would you guys normally spend on writing script writing for this case? Since you guys have the project, normally how long does it, do you guys really give the team like, okay, this is the amount of time you have <laughs> to write for the influencers and for them to create as well? Um, it's usually, <clears throat> I mean, it's so hard to say, like the creative strategy takes a couple of days, like five to six days. Um, then we have script writing for a couple of days. But because of creative strategies, so detailed scripts are a little bit easier just because of that. Then it takes a couple of days for content creators to shoot content and our in-house studio shoot content. And then basically then it's the editing. So yeah, it takes a while, but, um, I mean, we put a lot of effort into, into, wow. into so overall it would take like a month and to get all the creators out. Is that correct? Not like yeah, a week or so. Some, something like that. But once we are in the months two and three, it goes quicker. Oh, I have a question regarding like, let's say you work as an agency. Since you guys are focused on creating, uh, producing creatives, do you guys do the media buying at the same time? Or do you guys only supply the good for creatives for your clients and they run the ads? Yeah, we don't do media buying anymore. I mean, I don't do it anymore. So it's just strictly creatives. But we offer creative strategy and creative analysis, which is kind of an additional point compared to some other agencies that just give you content and that's it. So we want to, I, I go very deep into, into creative analysis. And that is why our month two and three are usually our best month, just because we gather so much good data. Right. So the first month would be just researching, uh, not, not much stuff going on because you still have to get the, uh, quality uh, the output out. And then second and third month is when the ads rolling, you can start to see good yeah. result and the client starts to see some result and get to communicate exactly. with you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, then I'm wondering for your agency, seeing, seeing you guys provide such a great value in terms of creative analysis, then. <clears throat> Would you get paid in terms of commission basis or would it be paid through a fixed fee? Because some agencies do differ, like some charge a fixed fee. How would you guys work for your case? Um, we, um, right now we have, uh, uh, packages and basically, um, uh, they, they just clients pay us based on the deliverables. So creative analysis and creative strategies basically for free. Um, wow. uh, because we just do content creation. We, we charge by the videos. Um, but of course, um, because we, we want to work with clients on the long form, long term, um, those analysis and that stuff, it, it's free. 
Right. So you guys wouldn't really, you guys didn't really engage in a profit sharing incentive. Um, no. It's more on just the fixed fees. Yeah. We help you produce the content. If you need more, just come back to us and we can give you more if you need it. Exactly. So this is the end of the episode. And then uh, tune in next time when me and Anzet will dive deeper into other stuff and see you next time.